We're back. This is Dear World Christian, the podcast, and my name is Jason. Thanks so much for stopping by today. Today, we're going to look at a common argument, if you will, against critical race theory, and that is when immigrants come to the United States, they do better than the people who live in the United States. So we got right here, we got good old Mr. Kurt Kennedy, and I'm going to let him tease it out, but we are going to stop and talk a little bit throughout. Let's go. Okay, I'm reloaded. He's reloaded. But today I want to do something just slightly different because I was watching a video and when I watch these type of videos, I understand what they're saying. There are things that I can even agree with about them. But one of the things that has happened in the last 10 years, more so than what I've than from what I think, is there is an oversimplification of very complex issues. Right. Okay. So let's just take a second real quick. He said in the last 10 years. So that means in since 2012. Okay. Just keep that in mind because he's going to reference some history in this video. And you're like, well, I thought we were talking about the last 10 years, my friend. But even more than that, he's going to talk about the oversimplification of complex ideas. Remember that the oversimplification of complex ideas. Oh, it's just this, or it's just that. It's an oversimplification. But I want to talk about, there's there's a channel that showed up, and I just watched it, and here is what the video was called. And some of you may not want to like this, but I do have, there's something Jesus said that I think makes me think, why are we talking like this? So here's the name of the video. The video is called Black Man Set Straight on Why Successful Immigrants Laugh at Black People with the Victim Mentality. All right. So let me give you some of the premise. So this is a, where there's a, a YouTube channel called Fresh and Fit. I want to play a little bit about what his commentary is. And then I want to I want to speak about one thing that's a common statement about this issue. But there's something that Jesus said that makes me question, like, why are you keep saying this about black people in particular? Okay. So I'm gonna I just want to real quick. I did jump past the, the video. And I just want to say that Kerr is doing a decent job of laying out the case in front. I don't think he does a good job of unpacking it, but he does do a good job of laying out what is the argument, what is the um, what is the pushback to the idea of systemic racism keeps black people from being successful. Now he's going to go in and explain. He's going to start unpacking it, and we need to do some uh, some interjection. So many of you have heard these conversations and arguments over the years, and there's some some truth to this, right? There's some truth to the victim mentality that can be played among Black people. This is a, a pretty popular kind of conservative perspective, and then you got the other side. No, it's all systemic racism, and then it's a... But there's something about this that Jesus said. There's something Jesus said that has always made me wonder, why is this rhetoric happening? Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, all right? I'm just going to read to you this, and then let's talk a little bit about what Jesus says here, and then I want to make two observations about just that commentary. As you can see, the rest of the video is essentially him attacking Black people for playing the victim and all of this stuff. They, they don't really make a lot of qualifications, right? unless you agree with their perspective. But here's what Jesus says. It makes me wonder, why are we talking like this? Here's what Jesus said. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 6, Jesus says, this is, the, this is what happens. While Jesus was walking in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, while Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head, and he was reclining at the table when the disciples saw it they were indignant why this waste they said this might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor aware of this jesus said to them why are you bothering this woman she has done a noble thing for me you always have the poor with you but you do not always have me. By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. All right. Full stop. 
I appreciate him reading the full passage. Excellent job reading the passage in context because the verse he wants to isolate, we see it in the context of what Jesus said. So that's excellent. Kudos to Kurt for that because most people would just say the poor you always have with you. He gave a good context of it. Good job. So this is God speaking, and Jesus makes a profound statement. He says this, when the woman comes, which we think is Mary, Probably so. and she's wiping his feet with her hair, they say, why this waste? We could have sold that and given it to the poor. And here's what Jesus says. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, Jesus wasn't making a socioeconomic statement in one sense, but this is also God, right? And God is speaking and Jesus makes a statement that makes me question, why do we keep making rants like this as if it's just this, that that's just the issue, that black people are just playing the victim when they struggle with making successful progress in America. Kurt is properly explaining the situation. The young man, that was explaining that immigrants come to this country and are more successful than people that live in this country. Later on, he's going to explain, he's going to give an example of people that live near the, live in San Francisco and see the Golden Gate Bridge all the time. They're not impressed by the Golden Gate Bridge, whereas people who are outsiders are impressed by the Golden Gate Bridge. Totally understand that. Great example, beautiful analogy. Gotcha. Here, he still doesn't address the issue that black people in America are not poor. Now, they, we might be poor according to American standards, but according to the standards of people outside, we're not poor at all. And please keep in mind, he's assuming that all black people are poor. <laughs> all black people that want something that is, are claiming systemic racism, that are claiming victim mentality, are poor, and that it's only a socioeconomic, uh, it's an economic issue. That's not true at all. Please have with you, okay? Now, the context of what Jesus was saying was not describing America, all of it. The context was, hey, there's always going to be poor people for you to take care of. You will not always have me. Okay, I think that's so perfect. God in the flesh. That's perfect. That is true. We, we will always have poor to take care of. Okay, so are you saying that Americans are always poor? Like, what are you saying? Like, what? Where, where's the correlation between systemic racism is not real Immigrants come to the United States and do whatever they want to do, and they're successful. And a poor you always have with you. How does that? Where, where's the correlation? Ash is saying poor people will always exist. You, they will always be here, and you will have ample opportunities to care for the poor. This right here is for me. So Jesus isn't making a socioeconomic statement. He's making a statement about humanity. There are always going to be poor people. Okay. So are you saying that again? Are you saying that we are poor in the States? I don't, I don't again, I don't get where he's trying to go with this. And he's actually going to get in a little bit deeper kimchi in a moment. I don't get what he's trying to say. All right. Let's fast forward 2,000 years. If they're always going to be poor people, that means that in every socioeconomic category of people, someone's going to be poor. I don't think anybody argued that. The gentleman is saying, why are we claiming a victim mentality for why we can't do well in the United States? That's what he was saying on the Fresh and Fit video. He's saying, hey, Y'all in a country that is prosperous, why y'all not prospering? People come over here and they prosper and then you look at them sideways. That's what he said. We get no indication from the Bible that everyone will be rich. We don't even get the American dream mantra from the Bible of equality of opportunity or whatever you want to call it. What we get is there are poor, there were poor people in Exodus. God was talking about caring for the poor and providing for the poor in Exodus, right? Fast forward okay. 2,000 years, why do we talk about the poor in such negative terms? And why do we talk about black people as if, if you're poor and not successful, then you're playing the victim? 
See, they're, they're, he, he conflated that. Nobody's saying that everybody, that we shouldn't take care of the poor. Nobody said that. Nobody's saying that. I don't, I don't know about the fresh and fit people, but the people in the church are not saying that you shouldn't take care of the poor. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying that all black people are poor. You're saying that, Kurt. Nobody's saying all black people are poor. That's what he's saying. And then even more than that, nobody is arguing that uh, nobody's saying that you can't, that success is the quintessential goal of everybody. And, and I don't believe scripture teaches that either. So I don't think we should say, Hey, if I'm successful in my own standards, then therefore God has blessed me or whatever like that. Nobody's saying that. And I just think this is a really a bad argument. But even God says that there will always be poor people. Jesus okay. didn't say how they would be poor if it would be of their own doing or forced upon them. He just said there will always be poor people. So why do we talk about the poor? I'm talking about we, I'm talking about fellow believers often do this. Why do we talk about the poor as if, why are they here? As if they're the Nobody's saying in that. our country. Nobody's saying it. Nobody's saying it. Why is the poor here? What people are asking is why are you claiming to be poor when you're not? That's what the problem is. And I do think also we could probably dig in a little bit more into what Christ actually, what's going on in this, um, in this discourse right here about the poor you should always have with you um, in reference to even the Sermon on the Mount. We can kind of look at that. And was he talking about, talking about the poor in spirit, maybe those people that need Christ, those they're going to always need them. They're, there's going to always be a need for Christ. Nobody will, you're not going to be in a situation where everybody has been satisfied with Christ because there's going to always be those who are poor. I think that we can make that argument, but that's neither here nor there. The discussion is why are you claiming to be poor when you are in fact not poor? That is the question. It's not that we're looking at somebody who is truly homeless, truly down and saying, how dare you live? How dare you be here? That's not the case. Nope. Nope. The case is, how dare Kirk Kennedy, how dare Jason Whitaker sit right here and say that you're poor when you are in the most prosperous country and we're still in, even, even if we're not doing as well as we would want to, we're doing quite well. That's what the argument is, Kirk. We talk about the poor in negative terms, but God says there'll always be poor people. That means there will be black people that will be poor no matter what. There will be white people that will be poor, Asian people, Indian people, all the categories of people that he named, there will be poor people. But for some reason- Has anybody said that there wasn't going to be that? I don't, I don't get where he's making an argument to say, because he brought in the argument about being poor. Nobody else on the Fresh and Fit show, they weren't saying that. They were putting everybody on equal footing and say, why are you not doing what you can, the best that you can do here in the United States? That's what he said. Kurt added a new angle to it by saying, well, some people are poor. Well, okay, that's fine. Some people are poor and nobody's arguing that they're not. But still, sir, why did you do that? Watch this one. Reason, for some reason, if you're black and poor in 2022, then you're playing the victim. That's not theological. That's theological. That's viewing people from... The American dream lens is that equality of opportunity, you should be able to attain it. And if you're poor, it's solely your fault. That's not a biblical perspective. Okay, so he's saying this is not a biblical perspective to say that. How are you making that claim then? Because he's going to make some other claims in a moment that are not biblical either, but he's going to stand on those. He's not going to, he's not going to shoot those off. I don't get this not a biblical perspective. And let me add one more thing to this, since I'm saying that. Let me give you how people use this, uh, this argument. In fact, this guy used the argument. He said this, when Indian people come mm -hmm. over here, they set up shop in black communities. When Asian people come over here, they set up shop in black communities. They also talked about in a different segment, Nigerians who are black like me, over here and have all this opportunity. So why don't black people like me who have been here can't have the same opportunity? Don't take advantage of it. This I think I think that's a good argument because please keep in mind, he made point to say these other immigrants come and set up shop in black communities because and they're getting rich in those communities by taking the monies from those communities. So the money was there already is what 
I think Kurt is kind of missing. Like the money's there. So if the money is there, why are y'all not using it? Is a is a clear and obvious question. Why are you not using money to set up shop? Why not? You just said the, the money's there. They, they use the money, and he gives the example in the uh, Fresh and Fit video as well. Argument sounds like an open and shut case on there's no systemic racism and all of that. Okay, let's talk about why this happens. The phrase that they use, that this guy using that use is used all the time, is the phrase come over here all right so let's take some time and dig into come over here and take the time and look it up i'm not going to put it on the screen because i don't want this to be a super long video what kind of people come over here what kind of people come to the united states relocate expatriate from their former country and become citizens in the united states what kind of people do that okay come over here what does that phrase mean no one ever unpacks what that phrase means Okay, if you're in another country, you don't just come to America. You and I could just get in our cars, fill up, you know, a, a $1,500 and fill up our gas tank and then just come over here, right? No, no, no. You have to have a degree of money, something to come. It is tough to just come over here to America. In fact, I would say the poorest of the poor in those other countries aren't the people that come over here. They're not the well, well, wait, Kurt, please understand our south, our southern border is wide open and those people are coming over here and they're not rich. They're not. I'm just saying now, yes, there are tons of people who move, come into the United States legally, come through the proper channels, all the kind of good jazz like that. But there are tons, tons of people who come other ways to come to America. Just saying the people that come over here. They're usually the best and brightest of those people that come over here, right? So you're not getting the average Joe, Nigerian, Asian, Indian, Iranian, or whatever you're getting. You're usually getting people who already have money, who already have a degree of intelligence, who already have connections and all of that. So that's okay. I mean, that's fine. But again, you're coming to the most prosperous nation where our poor people are richer than their, their rich people. So still, you have not excused, Kurt, the issue on the table, which is that black Americans are in this country already. They have those same things already. We're, we're, we're more educated than our ancestors. We have more wealth than our ancestors. We're able to move around this country freely. Sorry, we can move around this country freely more than our ancestors, Kurt. Come on. One side of come over here, right? There's another side of come over here. It's different. The phrase come over here, why are they coming? Because they're often leaving opportunities that are far worse than where they've come from. Uh, yes, so we agree. Coming to America, we they're agree. leaving a place that has no opportunity. We agree. And they come here. And then right. they think, well, see, America's land of opportunity. So when they come over here, why can't you do it? Because you're black and you've been here. Here's the problem. Let me use this as an example. Wait, wait, wait. Know. And he's going to use an example, and it's kind of long-winded, but I am going to kind of speed this section up. However, he doesn't address the fact that it's a reality. If I am not taking advantage of the, op advantage of the opportunities that I have here in the United States, that's nobody else's fault but Jason's. And he's not addressing that. He gives two really decent examples, but it doesn't excuse the error, which is that people don't take advantage of the opportunities available to them. Where, where you're from, what you're watching. I'm right outside of Washington, D.C., all right? Every year, there's something called the Cherry Blossoms Parade in D.C. Some years ago, the Japanese gave these cherry blossom trees to America, and we, they planted them all over D.C. Now, in D.C., is you got the Washington Monument, you got the White House, the Capitol. People come from all over the world every year. This cherry blossom parade is annoying if you're from here because you got to figure out how to drive around all the traffic and all of this stuff, right? You come here and people are blown away by what they see. But for me, I grew up here. I drive past the monument and the White House and the Capitol and whatever else anytime I want. Anytime I want. So I'm not impressed. When people come, it shocks me 
that people are blown away. They're like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful here. How could you not? And it's like, well, I kind of live here. I've been here a long time and it's just the same old same. If you're, you know, I, I San Francisco is one of my, it's like my second home at this point. When I first flew out there to preach out in San Francisco, there it is, the Golden Gate Bridge. It was like, oh my gosh, it's always in movies and you're excited and you're blown away. But the people who live there drive over it all the time. They're not impressed with the Golden Gate Bridge. It doesn't bother them. Now I've gone there so many times. When I see the Golden Gate Bridge, it's nothing to me. It's cool to see because we don't have bridges like that in D.C. So it's always cool to see like a big bridge like that. But in reality, I'm so used to it, it has no impact. But people fly all over the world to come just to see this bridge and to take pictures on it and to walk on it and do selfies and do videos. But the people who live in San Francisco, they were impressed because they've seen it for a long time. Now, why am I telling you this? Okay, so you heard the story. Now let's hear why he is telling us the story. Because when people live somewhere else and they come over here, they do have a different mentality. They haven't experienced the setbacks. They haven't experienced the historical ramifications. Like, let's just say- We're back. While I was recording the first time, something happened to the audio on the second portion of the video and it just became unusable. I didn't find this out until I started editing. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and interject myself from the future into the past, which is gonna be your future. Some it probably is gonna be your present because you're watching it now. You're gonna see a little bit of a costume change, but the content's gonna be the same. So I thank you so much for your patience, everybody. Yes. Grace, okay, tell me why. Because when people live somewhere else mm -hmm. and they come over here, they do have a different mentality. They haven't experienced the setbacks. They haven't experienced the history. Okay, I'm gonna let you finish, Kurt, but let me just ask you a question. Is that just making an excuse that y'all are not taking advantage of the opportunities that are available to you? Okay, okay, fine. I understand this. All these other circumstances and consequences that he's gonna delineate, but please keep in mind, there are people in other countries that are doing well in their country, in spite of the same situations and circumstances that Kurt is going over here. So the, the issue is, are you just making excuses for bad behavior or making excuses that people are not ponying up and taking responsibility for the cars that are dealt? I think that's really what the fresh and fit gentlemen were talking about. Historical ramifications. Like, let's just say systemic racism no longer exists. Let's just say that that's true. You know what does exist? The systemic consequences of that racism. It, again, like, is that not just saying, okay, now we got systemic consequences. Then we got systemic, it, it, something else you're going to add to it. You got systemic racism, systemic consequences, and now you got systemic something else that you're going to just add to the pot. Again, just giving excuses for not doing which was, again, the initial argument that many immigrants make when they come here. Like, hey, y'all are in this prosperous country. Do something with it. Oh, you saying that? Well, do something with that anyway. The reverberating consequences of those things have never exist. So let's take into account something like redlining. Redlining, I'm just going to simply explain this, is a was, a was a government law that they redlined certain neighborhoods, and those neighborhoods basically became the ghettos that Black people were only allowed to live in. Okay, and, and that's fine. But redlining is no longer existing today. So we can't make the excuse. And, and it's funny because I went back and watched the video. I don't like Fresh and Fit. Their language is not appropriate. So you can go find it. I'll leave, a, I'll leave the name and title in the description. But that's what they're saying in the video is that, hey, you've been dealt a bad hand of cards. Do something with it prosper with what you've been dealt with. And that's all they're saying. I don't understand why he's bringing up these things, which again, by the way, are not something that's happened in the last 10 years. Couldn't move into other places. And these neighborhoods, they did not invest in them. They didn't build anything that's in true. them. So no tax dollars went into, so the schools went bad, everything was just terrible. And these become ghettos. When the redlining laws ended, the 1967 Fair Housing Act and civil 1967, if I'm not mistaken, that was before Kurt was born. So again, we're talking about something 50 years in the past. Remember when he started, he said in the last 10 years, what are we talking about, sir? These are things that we can deal with today. There's nothing, there's, 
There's stuff that we can deal with today. Civil rights legislation, when that law ended, the consequences of living like that for decades did not. It wasn't like they said, hey, let's build you a new community with new opportunity. They just said, all right, we've changed the law. Now do what you got to do. Pull up your bootstraps. But you had created consistent decades of people being forced to live, not being able to get good jobs, all these things. And then you think because you changed the law that all of a sudden now, a couple of years later, these people are just poor. See, and again, we're not just saying he brought in the, the argument about Christ saying the poor you shall always have with you. I am not saying that black people are poor. I'm saying that black people, the highly melanated folk are rich. We're rich in resilience. We're rich in creativity. We're rich in in ingenuity. But we're instead of um, instead of leaning on that aspect of our culture, on that aspect, you go on immediately, Mr. Kennedy, to the fact that we're poor and we can't do anything. I'm sorry, so that's just not going to fly. Because they want to be there. Because they're playing the victim. Here's the reality. Black people are playing the victim. There are some. But to say it to the degree... But you just... Okay. <laughs> I don't think you... <laughs> you can't just say black folk are playing the victim to some degree. Unpack that. Like, spend a little bit of time on that. Why would somebody say that? Somebody's playing the victim. Like, give me an example. Expound on that some, sir. Because that is the issue that the gentleman had on the video was that black folk are playing the victim instead of doing and taking advantage and capitalizing on the opportunities that are in front of them. Yes, they've had a bad hand. There's been issues. No problem. But the vast majority of us are really not in bad shape. Let's just be honest, tell the truth, shame the devil. Again, Kurt, I, I just want you to just don't poo-poo that off and say, well, yeah, some people do. But the other ones, no, no, no. We need to unpack that because that is the problem. In which this guy does and other people, you know, if you Google the top 20 most dangerous cities in the world, there are some lists that will show two American cities. Usually mm -hmm. St. Louis and Baltimore That's will true. show up on that list. Actually, I have that list right here. I mean, it's true. Uh, St. Louis and Baltimore are on that list, and I will pull it up right here. All right. So most dangerous cities in the world. And he is right. St. Louis is right there, as well as Baltimore. I mean, it's a sad state of affairs. However, now New Orleans <laughs> just missed the top 20 by just one. To say that because these people are poor, that is primarily why the crime rate is so high, that would mean that all the other countries are extremely prosperous or they are extremely affluent. That's why they don't have crime. That's not the case. We know that's not true. Because um, if we scroll down, I mean, if we continue to scroll down, we'll see more and more. But it's not a matter of it being that they're extremely prosperous and that's why they're not. It's more of a matter of God's hand has uh, held back the sinful heart, nature of man's heart from expressing itself. That is more of the issue. Because just to say, well, because they're prosperous or because they're poor, that's why. Because I'm pretty sure if we did a search on just comparing the poorest countries in the world, as well as their their crime rate, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't see. Oh, that might be interesting. Let's see. Okay, so here are the poorest places on the planet, and they're not saying necessarily these are not cities, but these are countries. So let's just look at it real quick: India, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Democratic. Republic of Congo, as well as Bangladesh. So it would prop, it would make sense then that these countries would be on the, will have representation in the top dangerous cities too, right? But they don't. So it can't be just poverty is the reason why people are behaving like they're behaving. They're behaving like they're behaving because we're sinners. Let's just call it what it is and say it like it is. We're sinners and we do things like sin and therein is the issue. But let's get back to Kurt and let him finish up. The rest of that list has no black people in those cities. In fact, many of us who have traveled to different countries. And again, like going back to what he said, that's not necessarily true, Kurt. But those cities, I mean, those cities, 
any other time, y'all will be quickly claiming those cities as black or those people as as ethnic minorities, whatever you want to say. So I don't know if I would do that, Kurt. I don't think that's a good a good uh, way to parse through this. But let us continue. All of us know that there's a part of that country as beautiful as it is. You can go to some place like Italy or Mallorca or Greece or somewhere that is breathtakingly beautiful. But the day will tell you, hey, listen, at night, don't go down to this side of town. Why? Because it's more dangerous. Why? Because those people are poor. They don't have much. They don't have the same hope that people with money do. Is that is that really why? That's in any place in the world. <laughs> right. But is that the reason why, though? Is that why any any place, let's just stick in the United States, any crime-ridden city in the United States is because people don't have hope, because they don't have money and they're poor? Is that really why? Because if that be the case, then the most righteous people should be people who have a lot of money. Again, that just doesn't work. It does not but work. The right. idea that poor people are, that they have more crime because, simply because they're poor, I don't think really carries water. It has nothing to do with being black. It's not about playing the victim because you're black. It's you're poor and you have needs. So because I have, I'm poor and I have needs, then that means that I'm going to, by default, be a criminal? I, I, again, I don't believe that that I don't believe that that carries weight. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. If you really played that thought that out further, you realize that doesn't make sense. Poor people are not any less righteous because they're poor or because they they lack funds than a rich person is righteous because he or she has funds. That just doesn't that doesn't work out. It's us. We are the problem. It's not the lack of funds and whatnot, because they're very righteous, upstanding people who don't have a lot of resources. And there's very wicked, devilish people who do have resources. That's not the issue. The resources is not the issue. It is us. We are the problem. For the life of me, I don't know why Kurt is making so much hay about poor. And he's literally saying that black people are like all black people are poor. I'm pretty sure if we sat down with Kurt and discussed his own situation, I think we would clearly probably see he's and not poor. This, this notion that poor people are, are, are in a worse state simply because of their lack of resources doesn't hold water. You have desires. You see other people flourishing and you're not. This happens all over the world. All of I kind of want to talk about like, well, when I see other people flourishing, and I don't have it, and I want to go and commit a crime in order to get what they have. Boy, it sounds like that would be a sin, doesn't it? Over the world. This has nothing to do with being black and playing the victim. This has to do with what Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. There are always going to be poor people around. Okay. Yes, there are always going to be poor people around. No question or argument, no discussion there. But why are you assuming that the poor people have to be people of high melanin? Why do you figure that? Now, granted, in the text, it does seem like they're talking about a monetary resources, but still, why, why do black people got to be the poor people? I, again, I attest that we are not, in the United States, we are not poor compared to our ancestors on the continent. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's no way we can say that. It doesn't matter what American dream or what kind of government you set up. There's going to be someone that is poor. Jesus said this. Okay. Said, Nobody's arguing that. Right. <laughs> Nobody's disagreeing. Kurt. So when you're black in America, yes, there are times that we don't take advantage of the opportunities. But what if we stay there? What if we stayed right there for a second and really unpack that, Kurt, rather than you say, yeah, we don't take advantage of opportunities. but and then jump to another. Why don't you just spend some time there? So accustomed to being here. And, and here's the thing about the American dream. The American dream is an economic reality, right? It's about equality. You can have equality of outcome. You can have equality of, of, of circumstances. You can be, but that's not really true, right? The American dream have, was held back from people, from only particularly white men for a long time. So you promise. But what does that have to do with today though? Again. If, if you didn't tell 
most people that they wouldn't know that. And you didn't pound that into their head that you've been kept back and you've been oppressed and you've been disadvantaged. They probably wouldn't feel that way. I'm just saying, like, what, what does that have to do with us today? Maybe that applied to our grandparents. No question, no argument, discussion. But what does that got to do with us today? Because remember, he started out 10 years. He's now talking about stuff that's well past 10 years. Something and then said, no, we're not going to let you have it. And then you blame people for being upset that they can't have it. What is This it? is why I've said this before. I was on, I said this recently on Rules Lines Joint, that the equity, right, which is equal outcome, equity is revenge for not being able to have equality. Yeah. Are we, as Christians, supposed to be seeking revenge? Because are we supposed to be seeking revenge or should we be seeking justice? I'm just wondering, because if that be the case, then there is no injustice if you have the same opportunities today. Maybe your grandparents didn't. But what's that got to do with you today is a question I keep asking, and I don't see him giving an answer. The American dream promises equality of outcome, but oftentimes you couldn't have it. So now people are demanding, are demanding equality of outcome. Which still is not biblical, by the way. So by me saying, hey, I did not get the proper outcome in the past. Therefore, you must show partiality to another people group and give me favorable outcomes. That is still unbiblical. That is still a James type of situation where you're showing partiality. So I'm not understanding how you showed partiality in the past by showing partiality in the, or in the present that that does away with some past partiality. It doesn't work like that, sir. I'm sorry. They want, they want the same. They want the same thing. They want the... And so you get offended, like, oh, that's socialism, that's this and that's that. And whatever you want to call it, fine. But it's often just you promise people that they would be able to make a better life. And then you'd stop people from being able to make that life. Some of them because they were black or because they were Indian or because they were women. And so, so let's just say that. I, I, Kurt, are you saying that you don't have a better life than your grandparents? Are you saying that? Are you saying that you don't have a better life than your, maybe even than your parents? Are you saying that? I've said it before. Like, this is a proxy war. We're fighting on behalf of people who are well past oh, gone. Maybe and there were some inconsistencies. Maybe there were some issues in the past. I'm not arguing against that. What I am saying is that today, you are not in that situation. Again, this is like Ezekiel 18 being played out. And I keep saying Ezekiel 18 is always in play. And go back and look at it. This is exactly what he's talking about. He wants somebody else to pay for sins of their father that their father may or may not have committed, by the way. He wants them to pay for the sins of their father, not because the scriptures demand it, not because scriptures give us any place to do this. Again, if the world does that, we argue against the world, but in the church, we don't behave like the world. So that reality has consequences. American exceptionalism is only true when you compare America to other nations. But if we compare America to what the scripture says, it's not that exceptional. Okay, no problem there. I don't think anybody would disagree. We definitely have room to, to grow. We got room to repent. We got room to uh, turn back to God. Absolutely. Oh, In fact, I would say this, even the evangelical church, if you look back at the footage and you find out who was actually marching with Martin Luther King, you will find that more Catholics were behind them than Protestants. And I... Okay, so more Catholics supported King than Protestants. What's that got to do with anything? Uh, let's, let's Could be wrong out. in the numbers. But I can say this. I can say this, and I believe this to be true. That entertainment did more for Black people than the church. It wasn't the church. When people talk about, when I, when I ask Christians, when they talk about, was systemic racism over? When did it end? 1964 legislation, okay? All right. So again, 1964, this is past 10 years ago. Again, I'm just saying, Kurt, you said it was in the most recent in 10 years. So 2012, you've not told me very much that has happened in 2012 that would help substantiate your case. You've brought up several things in the past. And when I mean past, like 30, 40, even 50 years. You know what's interesting? Tell me what's in interesting. In 1995, the SBC... 1995, which again, 25 years ago. Came out with a resolution on racism and they apologized for individual and systemic racism perpetuated in our time. This okay, so the SBC and, and 25 years ago, which was considerably after the civil rights movement, said, hey, we apologize for our roles in that. Okay? 
And, and why is that bad? The 1995. So if systemic racism ended in 1964, the civil rights legislation, why is the church apologizing 31 years later for the, its continuation and perpetuating systemic racism? I, I think that's a great question, but let me ask you another question on the, on the heels of that. Did they do that because they sat down and looked at what they've done or were they browbeat into it? I don't know. But okay, so they, they apologized for it. They acknowledged it. Why is that bad? I don't get why it's bad. And and then to say, well, they didn't do it soon enough. Well, who who's to say that? Maybe attitudes and things like that. Ah, the poor you will always have with you. And I think, and, and, and not only that, we talk about the poor in ways that God just does not. Okay. <laughs> We talk about the poor in ways that God does not. Okay, okay, Kirk, because you've been talking about the poor in ways that God has not too. So let's just, okay, let's play this thing all the way out. God does not. He warns the rich. And yeah, there may be some verses like, yeah, if you're lazy, you'll be poor. But that's not really, that's different. The poor, God doesn't warn. He says he cares about. He recognizes that in this world, there will always be poor people. He does say that. He also says that you should not skew justice in favor of the poor or in favor of the rich, but justice should be meted out perfectly. So, I mean, we got to keep this thing. If we're going to play this game, Kurt, we got to do it correctly. And sir, that's not what the scriptures teach. And it's almost as if we're making poor people, we're venerating poor people because you're poor, you are more saintly because you're poor. You're more godly. That's almost what is he's projecting. I don't think that's what he believes, but it's what he's projecting. So on one level, while there is some truth, there are definitely some black people playing the victim. Could you stay, stay right there and just expound on that? What do you mean by there are some black people that are playing, playing the victim? Are you saying that there's, if we had a hundred black people, that there'd be 10 of them or 20 or like the vast majority? What are you saying when you say that? How are they playing the victim? How is the victimness being played out? Maybe you could expound on that because, again, I think you're shooing that issue off, but you're just shooting that off like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about this other issue. I think you need to be careful when you start thinking like that and dismissing reality because. And we're going to end right there. I think Kirk Kennedy in, in regards to his his lyrical skills and his poetic skills is top notch. Definitely a, a fantastic artist and entertainer in the Christian hip hop genre. In this regard here, I don't think that he did a good job. I don't think that this is his best work as it relates to discussing the poor, racism, critical race theory, and such like that. I don't think that was the best. But I want to encourage you to go back and look at the scriptures yourself. Read them. Read them and, and, and search out those scriptures as it relates to um, relationships between poor and the, um, the rich. Look at that James passage. Look at Leviticus and how the Lord has given us directions as it relates to metering out justice and such like that. And you decide. I appreciate you. Let's pray and let's get ready to get out of here. Father, I thank you today that we have a chance to use this medium of the internet and video to just discuss your word and to dig into it more deeply. I thank you for what you're doing in the life of Kirk Kennedy and his church and his family. I pray, God, that you'll bless him, continue to help him, Lord God, to discover your truth and to dig into your word that he might give his people what they need, which is the, the bread of life. I pray, God, for everyone that's watching and listening to this podcast, I pray that they will get, glean something from here that they too can apply to their lives, Lord God, and that they might one day hear well done, my good and faithful servant. We thank you so much for this time, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for supporting DearWokeChristian.com. I thank you all. And until next time, everybody, grace and peace.